SCP-7430, The Lockwood Mutilator. Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. The Foundation has infiltrated the local authorities in the town of Lockwood for a more efficient control over the anomaly. Disappearance rates of people between the ages of 15 and 50 must be constantly monitored. The forest surrounding the town must also be monitored through the use of 20 surveillance posts scattered throughout the area, used primarily by research teams and standard security personnel. Civilians found wandering alone in the forest must be persuaded to return to the more populated areas by the security team, who will pose as local rangers. Anyone successfully affected by SCP-7430 is to have their existence erased from the public eye and all records, except by this document. Drones and other unmanned means must be used for search and recovery of instances of SCP-7430-1, which are to be disposed of by incineration. Any civilian or staff members who have had contact with or is experiencing activity related to SCP-7430-1 is to be interrogated and, if necessary, properly amnesticized or quarantined depending on the severity of the effects. Any descriptions, news, entertainment, or acts of public reverence towards SCP-7430-1 are to be monitored and censored. Update. May 26th, 1986. Due to the nature of SCP-7430-1, directly describing the anomaly or tangible elements of its composition must be avoided. The use of thaumaturgical methods to neutralize the anomaly have been declared ineffective. Description. SCP-7430 is an anomalous event currently affecting the population of the town of Lockwood, Oregon. This event occurs approximately two to three times a year and causes the disappearance of a single civilian of any gender between the ages of 15 and 50. Generally, the disappearances themselves do not follow a specific pattern, although the consensus dictates that the zone where every person is last seen tend to be in areas close to the forest surrounding the town. Affected individuals often experience personality changes or unusual behaviors prior to disappearance, although the duration or intensity of this effect varies greatly. It is believed that at their highest level of intensity, disappearances can be caused by the spontaneous demanifestation of the individual. These disappearances always lead to the individual becoming part of SCP-7430-1. SCP-7430-1 refers to Data expunged. Footnote 1. Direct description of SCP-7431 and its components, instances, is detrimental due to its mimetic effects. The same applies to any catalyst used by it. Due to this, SCP-7431's capabilities and influence increase based on the number of successful SCP-7430 events, as well as the number of people interacting with any of its instances. It is believed that this effect can also be transmitted between individuals. Addendum 7430-1 Discovery The effects of SCP-7430 were finally discovered after the events of April 1st, 1986, when the disappearance of 26-year-old Evelyn Brock led to a massive anomalous event. Four days after being declared missing, an instance of SCP-7430-1 was found by local authorities and taken for study at the local forensic department. Due to the nature of the object found, doctors and members of the authorities as well as administrative and cleaning personnel present in the building ended up being affected by SCP-7430-1, which resulted in a massive exposure of the anomaly to the population of Lockwood. Approximately 59 individuals, including 24 members of the authorities and 35 civilians, were lost in the events of April 1st. Staff incorporated in the town who escaped the event alerted the Foundation and a mass amnestization program began on the entire population of Lockwood. In the following weeks, the properties and effects of SCP-7430 were determined. The present documentation was also updated to avoid direct description of SCP-7430-1 after this nearly led to a containment breach on May 26, 1986. Upon closer investigation of the town's history, it was discovered that the disappearances had been occurring for the last 11 years, although their effects had never reached a significant enough intensity to be discovered by the Foundation or 
In most cases, the respective instances of SCP-7431 were never properly found. In most of these cases, moreover, people had begun to attribute the disappearances to the act of an alleged serial killer, which led to an unsuccessful investigation by the local police, partly minimizing the suspicion of Foundation members infiltrated in its said authorities. Addendum 7430-2 List of relevant SCP-7431 instances Date, March 6th, 1981 Subject, Terence Phillips Age, 17 Catalyst, Data Expunged Description Subject is declared missing one day after leaving for school on the morning of March 6th. After two months of search, an instance of SCP-7431 is discovered by a group of campers, laying face down in a puddle in the southeast area of the local forest. Manifestation Lisa Hawkins, one of the campers, in the following weeks after the events, makes an appointment with her dentist due to a constant itchy feeling in her tongue. The sensation ceases after one month. No more activity is registered. Date, July 14th, 1981. Subject, Henry Bennett. Age, 37. Catalyst, data expunged. Description, the subject works as a part-time taxi driver. Witnesses claim to see him for the last time on the road heading into the northern area of the local forest. Following a six-week investigation, a local ranger discovers an instance of SCP-7431 resting on the shore of a lake, located at northwest of the area. A subsequent investigation reveals Mr. Bennett's vehicle, sunk in the bottom of the lake. Manifestation Mark Lopez experiences periodic cramps in his right feet, accompanied by a mild feeling of constant anxiety and difficulty for walking over the next two months. He later claims to have found himself humming a melody unconsciously every time he was alone. Date, March 9th, 1982. Subject, Harry Miller. Age, 15. Catalyst, data expunged. Description, last seen by his friends leaving high school during the afternoon after reporting a severe headache. Four days later, local police find another instance of SCP-7431 half-submerged in a creek near the northwest of the woods. Manifestation Officer Gregory Campbell, over the next seven months initially experiencing periodic severe migraines, suffers an increasing difficulty in making coordinated movements and a deterioration of existing speech skills over the months. In September, he is diagnosed with apraxia. By the end of the year, Mr. Campbell reports occasional nightmares, usually related to the amputation of one or both legs. The officer usually describes this act as being accepted by him in the dream, out of utilitarian sentiment. His health progressively improves over the next year. This experience seems to result in Mr. Campbell becoming extremely religious. Date, November 30th, 1983. Subject, Vanessa Higgins. Age, 23. Catalyst. Data expunged. Description. The subject, a medicine student, experiences severe episodes of anxiety attacks and paranoia during the months prior to the disappearance, many times declaring that she was being constantly persecuted. Although Mrs. Higgins is prescribed with medication according to her unstable mental state, and despite moving back into her parents' house because of it, her behavior only becomes more erratic as the months pass. The subject disappears at dusk on Wednesday, November 3rd, during a violent episode of anxiety running away from home. The next morning, on November 4th, 46-year-old Mary Grant, residing at a vacational cabin in the East Woods, discovers an instance of SCP-7430-1, half-buried in a large mound of snow near the cabin. Manifestation during the next two nights after the event, Mrs. Grant experiences severe night terrors and visual hallucinations related to multiple human legs, footnote 2, 32 approximately, sticking out of the snow surrounding the cabin overnight, along with sightings of small wooden figures hanging around the cabin that disappear as soon as they are seen again. She also reports occasional cramps in her left leg during this time period. Date July 23rd, 
1984. Subject, Claire Hawkins. Age, 21. Catalyst, data expunged. Description, subject goes on a camping trip with her sister and two friends on what was originally going to be a three-day trip to the southeast area of the forest. After dinner on the second night, the girl leaves her tent at approximately 2 a.m. in the morning for no apparent reason. The people who accompanied her collaborate during the next three days together with the rangers and local authorities to search for her in the area. Her sister Lisa finds an instance of SCP-7431 hanging upside down from a tree. Manifestation On July 29th, during her sister's funeral, Lisa Hawkins hears the muffled sound of female laughter from beneath the ground. She experiences a severe headache that forces her to walk away from the event to collect herself. During the next 11 months, the girl experiences multiple spontaneous auditory hallucinations of teeth chattering for prolonged periods throughout the day. Severe jaw pain develops, which progressively worsens her ability to eat throughout the year. She also begins to have strong night terrors and visual hallucinations involving her sister, running naked in the distance into the woods. All of this results in her developing a strong anxiety disorder and the habit of rambling nonsense words and prose when alone. On the morning of May 8, 1985, Lisa is in the local Catholic church with her relatives. Just as the people at the mass begin to recite their prayers, Lisa begins to emit meaningless ceremonial vocalizations. Subject's parents try to calm her down due to the intensity of these phrases, causing her to recite said vocalizations louder and faster. The prayer is interrupted, and the priest approaches the family to ask if the girl is all right. At that moment, and as she would later declare, Lisa mistakes the rosary worn by the priest for a teeth necklace and goes into a panic attack that leads her to slip up and hit her head against the bench, dislocating her lower jaw. The young woman is hospitalized, and no further abnormal activity is registered after this event. This particular case generated discontent in the student body of Claire's university, leading to multiple protests claiming the ineffectiveness of the police to catch the alleged serial killer responsible for the case, nicknamed as the Lockwood Mutilator to whom six past disappearances were attributed. Date, November 7th, 1984. Subject, Edward Miller. Age, 48. Catalyst, data expunged. Description, the subject spends the last two days before his disappearance wandering through the woods. Witnesses claim to see him in the distance heading northwest and avoiding making contact or being seen by people. Eventually, he is no longer seen and is officially declared missing on November 7th. Three weeks later, on November 29th, a group of elementary kids on a school winter trip accompanied by one of their teachers witnesses an instance of SCP-7431 rolling through the snow down a hill until stopping in front of the group. Manifestation December 2nd Susan Berkeley, 9 years old Screams during English class when she feels a very big spider crawling up her leg. No spiders are found neither on her clothes or in the classroom. December 3rd. Stephanie Corbet, 9 years old. Hears a constant tapping on the window of her bedroom during the night. Claims to have woken up a few minutes later to a quiet song coming from outside. December 3rd. Timothy Wright, 8 years old. During a math class, claims to hear music coming from one of the cabinets in the classroom. It stops after 20 seconds. December 4th, Jim Taylor, 9 years old. Finds a human finger sticking out of the dirt of a flower pot in the school hallway. After this, the kid decides to notify his teacher. When the teacher comes to check the pot, there is nothing. December 4th, Madison Grant, 8 years old. Claims to have witnessed the crucifix of Jesus Christ in the classroom making signs in silent language with its hands during a literature class. Despite declaring herself scared, the girl does not notify the teacher of this and no other kids in the classroom seem to notice this event. December 6th, Andrew Lopez, 8 years old. Home alone in the afternoon, waiting for his father to come home from work. The boy finds himself watching Sesame Street. Apparently, after watching two episodes, 
the boy witnesses a third episode titled Come in Handy. In this episode, Elmo's character is shown in front of a brick wall with a closed wooden door with the crucifix on top of it. Elmo is shown frustrated and not being able to open the wooden door, apparently because he lacks the strength to turn the knob. At that moment, Big Bird's character appears on screen and asks him the reason behind his frustration. After Elmo explains that he's angry because he can't open that door, Big Bird explains the importance of accepting help from others to achieve your goals, and how everyone needs a helping hand sometimes. At that moment, Big Bird uses his beak to remove the glove on the left hand of his costume, exposing the real hand of the actor underneath the costume. Big Bird encourages Elmo to use his hand. Elmo easily removes the human hand from the suit as if it were a mannequin, and uses it to turn the knob. The door opens slowly, revealing what appears to be a desolate wooded area covered in snow in the middle of the night. The area appears to be a real location. Both characters stay silent and turn their heads towards the camera without moving. The sound of winter wind can be heard coming from the door. After two minutes of the character standing still in front of the door, Andrew gets scared and leaves the room without turning off the TV. The kid comes back after half an hour to check the TV. He leaves again after verifying the same scene is still there. When Andrew's father arrives at dusk, he finds his son waiting for him on the porch. The TV is now playing a repetition of the first episode of season 14, Big Bird at Camp. There is no known record of the episode described by the kid. When pressed for further details, Andrew describes how the show's intro song, Sesame Street Theme by Joe Raposo, had been replaced with a different melody. December 8th, Lockwood Elementary School. During the morning, approximately a number of 40 paint handprints are found in the walls of one of the school bathrooms. These handprints range in size from 5.5 to 22.6 inches. December 8th, Stephanie Corbet, 9 years old, wakes up in the morning with her body and face covered in bruises. The little girl's neck shows strangulation marks. The child is helped and taken to a hospital by her parents. An investigation is opened for a possible case of domestic abuse. December 8th. Ian Flynn. Physical education teacher Ian Flynn attempts to strangle the priest of the local Catholic church, initially using his bare hands, then using the priest's rosary. The subject is separated and arrested, unable to give statements, being in a state of dissociation. Although no charges are filed, Mr. Flynn is not allowed to go near the church again. The subject would later declare himself confused about the event. December 9th, Lockwood Elementary School. The hands of the crucifix of Jesus in one of the classrooms disappear. Date, November 5th, 1985. Subject, Aaron Woodfield. Age, 46. Catalyst, data expunged. Description. The subject, a 46-year-old local park ranger, is arrested on November 2nd on suspicion of being related to the disappearance of students Elizabeth Taylor and Marissa Clark in January and July of the same year. The suspicions on the part of the authorities were due to witnesses who declared how in both cases, they saw the girls in desolate areas being followed by Mr. Woodfield, being in the case of the second victim, at a time that did not coincide with the subject's work schedule. He also was linked to the disappearance of a prostitute in December 26, 1974, to whom he had allegedly frequented in the weeks before the disappearance. After an inspection of the subject's home, and despite the fact that no traces of the students were found, the school uniforms and belongings of the two girls were found buried in the backyard of the home, along with the backpack that would later be discovered to belong to Claire Hawkins, a previous victim of SCP-7430. The news became a scandal in the Lockwood community, who blame him for the other disappearances on suspicion that they were caused by the activity of a serial killer in the area. Footnote 3. This would later cause the assault on his brother in November 4th while he was performing a mass at the local church. However, Mr. Woodfield suddenly disappeared during an interrogation at the East Precinct Police Station. Subject had experienced strong paranoia and instability in the days before the disappearance. The investigation is left inconclusive since no further traces of Mr. Woodfield are found 
and due to the discovery of more belongings of disappeared victims in another three homes near the residence of the subject and in the courtyard of the local elementary school. No instance of SCP-7431 is found in this case. The interview conducted with Aaron Woodfield, formerly owned by the Lockwood Police Department prior to the tape's confiscation, is attached below. Transcript of Aaron Woodfield's Last Interrogation Tape Recorded Interview Aaron Woodfield, Detective John Mendez November 5, 1985 Begin Log Mendez This is Detective Mendez, Lockwood Police Department. Today is Tuesday, November 5, 1985. Current time is 7.36 p.m. This is a taped conversation with the last name of Woodfield, first name of Aaron, date of birth, February 16th, 1939. Okay, Aaron, I just turned on this tape recorder so we can have this conversation more easily. It's almost the end of my shift, and I don't have the patience to stay here all night, so don't make me. Let's not repeat what happened a couple of days ago, okay? Aaron? Woodfield. Oh, okay, sir. Please speak up a little bit. Yes, sir. Good. Well, as you may know, since we talked at last time, uh, you were detained on suspicion of being involved in the disappearance of the two girls this year. Footnote 4. It would later be confirmed that the instances of SCP-7431 corresponding to these cases were still missing. You assured me that you never had any contact with them. Is that correct? Aaron, I'm talking to you. Yes. Okay, so you do remember. Aaron, you made it clear to us that you had nothing to do with the case, even though we have three witnesses who saw you following the girls, one of them late at night in the middle of the forest. When we asked you, you told us that it wasn't you, despite the fact that two of the witnesses recognized your face. Is that correct? It wasn't me. You told us the same thing last Saturday. Do you have any way to prove it? Look, ever since we pulled you over a few days ago, we've been searching through your home, Aaron. Yesterday we found belongings of both girls buried in your backyard. What? We also found a backpack belonging to a young woman who disappeared one night you did duty. July 23rd, 84. We found dried blood on the backpack, Aaron. Oh. Okay. Listen carefully. I need you to tell me if you did something to those girls and why. I swear I didn't do anything. I I swear I... Calm down. Take it easy. I'm going to need you to be more clear with me. I... I did see them. Both. In the woods. But I didn't do anything to them. I'm I'm scared. Why are you scared? So, you did have contact with them. No, I, I never even touched them. I swear, I never met them, but it was during my shift. In January, I saw this girl. Are you talking about Elizabeth? I think. She was wearing a school uniform, and she was wandering alone in a dangerous area. We don't let minors do that, but because of the animals and... After five minutes, when I finally got to her, she was already dead, hanging in a tree. What do you mean, she was dead? She was dead, man. She was naked and looked like her redacted, had been ripped off. Are you telling me you just found a dead body and never reported it? Sir, she... She turned her head to me and started talking. And her voice, it it didn't sound like a girl's. It sounded like, didn't you just tell me she was dead? She was dead and, and she was smiling. She told me that it would be disrespectful to leave her lying there. She said that her parents would be very sad if they never found her or something like that. She kept begging me to get close to her. Aaron, I don't understand. I ran away. I kept hearing her calling my name. I went home, then I thought it was maybe just a joke. And then I saw her face on the news, everywhere. 
and the same thing happened with the other one, the same uniform, the same smile. And I just didn't want the same thing to happen again, but it was very dark. I couldn't. Okay. Okay. Aaron, why did you never tell anyone? Because no one would believe me. And now weird things keep happening. I can't stop finding redacted spread all across my backyard. And the girls are everywhere, smiling at me. They're under my sofa, in the ceiling. A few days ago, I went to the bathroom. I caught them looking at me over the shower curtain. I almost had a heart attack. Sir, I just want to be able to sleep again. Please. At that moment, the interviewer is distracted by a flickering in the lights of the room, causing him to look up at the ceiling for an instant. When turning to the front... Mr. Woodfield is no longer there. Mendez inspects under the table without success. What? Mendez inspects the entire room. There is no trace of Mr. Woodfield. What the fu- End log. Manifestation? Not applicable. Addendum. 7430-3. First chronological manifestation of SCP-7430. During the investigation period of SCP-7430 following the events of April 1st, 1986, information was gathered from the locals to establish a timeline of events surrounding the anomaly. This was how the first official disappearance related to SCP-7430 was discovered, referring to nine-year-old Thomas Hefley on December 24th, 1974. Mr. Hefley, who was now 21 years old at the time, who had been living with his family in Nevada since 1978, was contacted to provide his experience with the incident. Said interview is attached below. Thomas Hefley, who lived his childhood in Lockwood, disappeared on the night of December 24th in the middle of a family reunion. After being unsuccessfully searched for by his parents and uncles, the authorities were alerted. Two days later, Thomas, unconscious, was found nearly buried by snow in a remote area of the woods, with only a single, redacted, missing. He was rescued and sent to the hospital, where it was not possible to explain how the infant would manage to survive so long without dying naturally from hypothermia. The boy's testimony was not made public. In 1986, Thomas was contacted by the Foundation and interviewed at his current residence in the state of Nevada by Agent Redacted on May 26th at 1.23 p.m. Begin Log Interviewer could you describe your experience living in Lockwood, Oregon? Hefley. Yeah, of course. Uh, I lived there my entire childhood. My dad and my grandpa moved there when he was a teenager. Nice, calm town. Lots of nature. Please, try being more specific. Um, my father worked at a gas station. Mom worked at home. I didn't have many friends, but the townspeople were... Always very friendly, although somewhat superstitious. What do you mean by superstitious? Well, you know, the town, it wasn't very big until more people came to live there in the 70s. Before, they had always been that kind of closed community. I don't think I need to explain. Please, explain in great detail. <sighs> My grandfather always talked about the people who used to live there in the woods. Weird religions. I always thought they were like hippies. According to him, they were more like gypsies or something like that. People used to find weird necklaces in the trees. Weird music coming from the woods at night. The townsfolk fed urban legends to scare the kids, including dad. We stopped hearing anything from those people during the 60s, though. Interesting. Thanks. Thomas, I understand that there was also some strange disappearances during the 70s and 80s, right? Uh, no. I, I don't know. Your family moved in 78, right? Hadn't there been a wave of people disappearing? Murders or something like that? Well, uh, I guess I just heard some rumors. They said there was a, a man in the woods, a murderer or something. The son of a friend of dad's also disappeared. I think that scared him. 
I always thought he had just run away. I don't really know. Thomas, we know that you apparently disappeared for two days when you were nine years old. Christmas of 74, remember? Could you tell us something about that day? I'd rather not talk about that. It is not a matter of what you prefer or not. Thomas, please describe what you remember about that day. Why? Are you with the government or something? I d Thomas, I have a group of officers waiting outside. Uh, I remember it was on Christmas Eve. My grandfather had a cabin in the outskirts. We used it for family events, things like that. I only have vague memories of what happened before. We were at the cabin. It was night and everything was covered in snow. Dad had trouble parking us earlier. Uh, I was on the couch. I had been playing with mom. We were waiting for dad to finish dinner. I remember my aunt called mom to ask her for help with something, I think. I don't remember what. I think I fell asleep. It felt like being asleep or I got distracted. I don't know. When no one was looking, I got up and walked to the exit. I was walking through the snow, up the hill. I couldn't see anything. Why did you do that? I, uh, I don't know. I don't think I wanted to. I could hear my mom calling my name. I could see the cabin from above, far away. I think I ignored it and kept walking. It was all very dark and I was freezing. I remember touching the branches while walking through the trees to guide me. It felt like being disassociated, like I was dreaming. It scares me how easy it was. Please, Thomas, focus. What else do you remember? I kept walking for a while longer, an hour maybe? Definitely an hour or two. Uh, there was this circle of trees I got in. I think uh, I saw clothes, rags in the snow. I touched a, uh, a figure made with sticks. I don't remember what it looked like. I collapsed right there. I felt like I was dying. Can we, can we stop here? Is that it? I don't want to tell more. This is why I don't tell anyone. At one point, they don't believe me, but then they start doing weird things. Please, leave my house. That is irrelevant. Any substantial information you have, you must tell us. Please, I... This is a very serious matter. If you do not cooperate, there could be serious repercussions for you or your family. I remember images, or I dreamed them, but I was more or less conscious. Uh, there were people dressed in white, dancing. Yeah, they, they were dancing, whistling the song. It wasn't cold anymore, it was daytime. I think it was summer, maybe, or spring. They wore crowns made with flowers and necklaces. Remember, uh, the stick figures? Yes. Well, there was something like that, but bigger. It was much bigger. It was like a statue or an idol, all made with sticks and branches. Those people were hugging it, singing to it. I felt how they grabbed my arms, my legs. I was collapsed. They brought me close to it. They put me inside and then pain. Felt blood in my mouth. What I saw inside, I, I don't remember. Too diffuse, but I remember my surprise. It's not something you'd expect to see inside a statue, especially one made out of wood, you, you know? Are you sure you don't remember what you saw? Nothing comes to your mind. Data expunged. Many little ones. I see. Please, I swear every time... Interviewer groans. Like this one? Yes, exactly. Please, can you leave now? What, what, what are you do- End log.
Following the interview, both Mr. Heffley and his family were amnesticized so that they would have no memory of his disappearance. Agent Redacted was recovered and quarantined for two days. Update. Addendum. 7430-4. Incident 7430-1. 1997. On April 1st, 1997, after 10 years of successful containment by Foundation assets, the first breach of SCP-7430-1 occurred. The individual responsible for said breach was found to be 20-year-old student Caleb Brock. Unlike other cases involving SCP-7430-1, Caleb's case stands out for his understanding of certain qualities of the anomaly and awareness of the Foundation's presence and its involvement with local authorities. As of his entry into the woods on March 28, 1997, a search and capture of the individual began, in which Caleb actively evaded security forces. Footnote 6. The individual is believed to have accomplished this through, or assisted by, anomalous means, until he disappeared, resulting in the breach of April 1st. Caleb carried a journal with him, in which he initially expressed his personal problems derived from his tumultuous mental state, later writing his conjectures regarding the Foundation and the Anomaly, and a record of his exploration of the woods. Below is a chronological reconstruction of the events that occurred in April 1st, 1997. On the night of March 31st, Caleb is officially declared missing by Foundation assets, and the extraction of the resulting instance of SCP-7430-1, as well as the prompt removal of any records relating to Caleb Brock, becomes a priority. 5.34 AM SCP-7430-1 instance corresponding to Caleb Brock is found by security drones in the western area of the forest, the furthest from the city, resting in a circle of trees. 5.58 AM The Hefley's Christmas cabin, close to the anomaly, is raided by Foundation agents for the extraction of personal items belonging to Brock. His backpack and personal diary are recovered for immediate analysis. 6.26 AM Examination of Brock's journal entries begins. SCP-7430-1 instance successfully recovered by extraction drone. 7.22 AM The recovery drone deviates from its usual route to the incineration area, heading instead to the nearest research post, 3 kilometers away, due to what is believed to be anomalous influence. The main supervisor of drone operations in the area does not report this. It is believed because at that time, he was helping the analysis team with Caleb Brock's diary, which were beginning to be affected by the cognito hazards of its entry, particularly the one corresponding to March 31st. How the team failed to detect the evident presence of cognito hazards is still being investigated. 7.56 AM Drone successfully enters Research Post 3, drops SCP-7430-1 instance in Main Hall. SCP-7430-1 is first witnessed by 23 Foundation employees and 12 security guards. A total of three employees and two security members leave the facility in anticipation of the hysteria. 8.24 AM SCP-7430-1 has affected all personnel in the area. Manifestation events begin. According to certain testimonies related to the personnel performing tribal dances and laceration rituals. This behavior extends for the next 90 minutes. 8.59 AM Investigation Post 2 becomes aware of the possible containment breach in Post 3 after several failed attempts to communicate with the site. The Foundation is alerted. 9.52 AM A nude staff member is detected hoisting Caleb Brock's SCP-7430-1 instance onto the flagpole on the building's roof. 9.54 AM Various drones surrounding Research Site 3 record the building beginning to sink into the ground along with the personnel inside. This process ends after 14 minutes. 10.30 AM SCP-7430-1 manifestation slowly emerges from the ground as a black-type entity, 34 meters long, composed of a complete bone structure, 206 individual parts emulating human skeleton. A state of emergency is declared, and the evacuation process begins at the other research posts, while various methods are devised to neutralize the entity as soon as possible. 10.51 AM 
SCP-7431 begins to vocalize a musical melody in the sound of trumpets. 11.02 AM. Scranton reality anchors are deployed in an attempt to demanifest the entity. These suddenly overload and stop working. Upon deactivation, the anchors turn into several human legs sticking out of the ground. These move along with the melody sung by the entity. 11.09 AM. The entity begins to wander through the forest on its way to the town. Its passage through the area generates a forest fire. 11.47 AM. Despite the Foundation's effort, the entity arrives to Lockwood, beginning to expand its influence on the population. During the next two hours, riots break out in the streets and a large part of the population tries to leave the town, saturating the streets. 12.30 AM. The forest fire spawned by SCP-7431 spreads to the southeast of the forest. Attempts to put out the fire demonstrate that the flames can't be extinguished, being of anomalous nature. Approximately 47 civilians are deemed lost due to the manifestation of SCP-7431. Around 8 deaths are registered due to the riots and the esoteric behavior generated in civilians by the entity. 12.49 AM an operation begins with the goal of deploying several Scranton reality anchors to distract the entity while civilians attempting to leave the city are evacuated. 1.05 PM 104 civilians lost due to the entity. 1.19 PM In the western area of the woods, Security Officer Waylon Davis, who had fled Security Post 3 during the staff exposure to SCP-7431, returns to the entity's original manifestation zone by accident while escaping the fire. There he finds the flagpole with SCP-7431, half-buried coming out of the ground. He improvises a blindfold to try not to see the instance directly, and spends the next 10 minutes trying to tie off the object. 1.29 PM 20 Scranton reality anchors are deployed and activated in areas surrounding the entity. 30 Foundation evacuation helicopters arrive to extract as many civilians as possible. Another 30 are deployed. Waylon Davis manages to extract the instance of SCP-7431 completely. He begins looking for where to incinerate the object as quickly as possible. 1.52 PM 400 civilians are successfully evacuated. 12 more helicopters arrive. The fire spreads to the northeast of the forest. Seven of the Scranton reality anchors deployed around the manifestation malfunction and transform into redacted, dancing on fire around the entity. Officer Waylon Davis finds a pile of burning trees. He immediately drops SCP-7431 in it and waits for the object to be engulfed in flames. 2.01 PM SCP-7431 instance is completely covered in flames. Waylon Davis confirms this and escapes the area. The entity resulting from the manifestation remains completely immobile for four minutes, then proceeds to demanifest. Manifestation neutralized. 2.02 PM The fire generated by the entity begins to extinguish. In the same way, the vegetation of the area is restored. 2.59 PM Several evacuation and medical assistance vehicles from the Foundation arrive to help the civilians. By the end of the day, the town has been completely evacuated and quarantined by the Foundation. Addendum 7430-5 Recovered Materials After the event, Caleb Brock's journal was successfully examined. An entry corresponding to March 24th is left here below which constitutes the entry related to the event with the lowest number of cognitohazardous elements. March 24th. I still remember when Eve's friend passed away. I was very young, but I think I understood the situation. She was so sad that I decided that I wanted to accompany her to the funeral. And I remember everything perfectly. I don't know why, but I do. Although she used to tell me that I shouldn't forget anything, and I promised her that I would remember, even the smallest detail. I remember that it was a winter day, full of snow. I remember the expressionless face of everyone who attended the event. Also, the hurt face of the parents. I remember holding her hands as I looked at the finely carved tombstone. Vanessa Higgins
I also remember what they used to say at school. There is a man in the woods. They say that when no one is looking, wherever you are, he catches you and takes you. Then he claims his trophy and leaves what's left of you to rot in the wild. If you stay still, near the forest, you can hear it, singing his melody. He used to be a park ranger, or a surgeon, or a mental patient, or a police officer. He prefers women and teenagers. Shortly after Eve left, I went back to the cemetery, to the exact spot where her friend had been buried, next to her grandmother. Do you know what I found? Nothing. I wanted to find out, ask the cemetery administration, her family about it. Do you know what I discovered? There never was a Vanessa Higgins. Her parents never had children. And Eve. I was always an orphan. Since mom and dad died in the crash. Only son. I know it's not like that, but I don't know why. The sister of a classmate. I asked him if he remembered his sister, Marissa. Marissa Clark. He froze for a few seconds, paralyzed, as if his brain couldn't recognize my question. I thought he was making fun of me. And the mutilator? Nobody remembers. And those who do believe it was just a myth. A game created by impressionable children. I know there are people in the forest. I once saw them, with weapons, robes. People occasionally see objects flying over the trees. And then I saw her in my dreams. Eve. She cried. She said she was burning. She told me that they had taken her, so no one would find her. So that no one would remember her. Her voice sounded different. And then the nightmares came. The streets on fire. People running. Her smile bigger than ever. People jumping up to her mouth, disappearing. Her voice, saying that weird name over and over again. Cognito hazard removed. The last time I saw her. I'm tired. I feel like I'm going crazy. I've been trying to remember and gather courage. I'm going to the place she told me. To the west. Past the abandoned cabin. Going up the mountain. Towards the circle of trees. I promised her I would go. I prefer to close the cycle rather than continuing to see people forgetting things. People. I even prefer to be mutilated and everyone to forget me than to pretend that none of this happened. And if someone is reading this and I don't come back, go find me. On the mountain. All the information is right there. Do not forget me. Come and find me. I'll be there. April 19th, 1997. Updates concerning SCP-7430. Since the events that occurred in April, we have reconsidered various aspects of the anomaly. For starters, SCP-7430's anomalous effects has sharpened. When we went after Caleb, there was no way to explain how an ordinary civilian could have evaded our drones, patrol agents, search vehicles, etc. Based on certain contents of the boy's personal diary, we believe that he was guided and aided by SCP-7430-1 to some degree in achieving his goal, meaning that the anomaly has become a more latent danger. Although so many years of successful containment served to reduce the speed of SCP-7430's anomalous effect over a fairly considerable time span, which is four days after the disappearance of an affected individual, since the breach, the effect seems to have sharpened. In the last few days, we have registered multiple cases of wildlife disappearing spontaneously, including those that inhabit the forest as well as birds. We believe that if this effect continues with the same frequency, in two weeks a third of the total fauna in the area will be lost. Our research team had already elucidated that while the anomaly was incomplete, and that incineration of the various of its instances slowed their ability to cross into our plane, each individual manifested by SCP-7430-1 is proportionately more destructive, regardless of the catalyst used. Yes, maybe this time SCP-7431 chose a catalyst that would grant it something it hadn't had before, the ability to fully manifest and move voluntarily. But it doesn't change the fact that, hypothetically, 
it wouldn't take much more than an eye to wreak havoc on a population. We had considered the idea of the Kashuta Kuro from Japanese folklore as a historical manifestation of SCP-7430-1. But further study revealed an interaction of the anomaly with the indigenous groups that originally inhabited the region that is today, Oregon. In the same way that happened with our third research post, we believe that this had an impact on said community developing esoteric and violent behaviors, many times with the extirpation and veneration of human anatomy as a central theme. The subsequent abandonment by these people of the area that caused the drastic reduction of the capabilities of the anomaly could explain certain qualities of SCP-7430-1. Similar to other beings of thaumaturgical nature, it seems to develop itself based on its perception and the offerings made to it. We should consider ourselves fortunate that it does not understand human physiology in its entirety beyond its destructive interpretations. Regarding the people who came later, we know rather very little. We have some general information, a cult of about 13 families, including that of a mayor. They used children, very young, from 6 to 11 years old. They would leave them in the forest, alone, and return to search for them after three days. In all cases, they would lose a single tooth. It was a kind of offering, a thaumaturgical ritual to appease. Only instead of sacrificing human hearts, infant teeth were used. They would repeat this process once a year, from 1942 to 1961, every time with a different kid. Then something happened in 1962. An eight-year-old girl, redacted, was the first one to appear mutilated. The rest were not stupid, and clearly distressed they left the area. The solution was rather simple. Don't let more people jump into the grind. Allowing the anomaly to manifest itself and expose itself to even more people. SCP-7430-1 should not be considered a god, a ghost, a nymph, a forest spirit, let alone a serial killer. SCP-7430 should be considered non-existent, and this should form an essential part of our containment procedures. We believe that the current situation of SCP-7430 makes impossible any normal habitation in the town, as well as any type of containment as long as there are people living in the area. We have evacuated the entire town of Lockwood, and considering the above, it is a good time to apply our proposal to update the containment methods as well as a description of the anomaly for a more efficient containment. Redacted, SCP-7430 Research Team Supervisor. SCP-7430, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. The town of Lockwood, Oregon has remained evacuated and quarantined along with the surrounding forest since 1997. Roads leading to the town or that cross through said forest area have been removed and rerouted. In the same way, the population that inhabited the region was totally amnesticized and relocated, together with all records of the town's existence erased. A fenced quarantine zone has been established around the 1,367,173 acres that the forest surrounding the town covers, and which concentrates the greatest anomalous activity. Any unauthorized person attempting to cross said containment must be urgently arrested and amnesticized. Individuals who have crossed the breach must be terminated as soon as possible, by any means possible. Testing on human subjects to test the capabilities of SCP-7430's effects is strictly prohibited. Exploration into SCP-7430 is currently prohibited. It is only allowed to be monitored by the use of drones and other unmanned means. In the event containment fails and an SCP-7431 event occurs, the protocol Vita Custodia is to be put in place, making use of the Scranton Reality Anchors available in the area, as well as remotely activated incineration devices scattered in the whole forest. No further protocols will be needed to extinguish the subsequent fire. All personnel assigned to SCP-7430 are to be subsequently amnesticized to forget the event. Unless the Vita Custodia protocol must be put in place, there is no SCP-7431, and all staff should be informed about it. Description SCP-7430 is the abandoned city of Lockwood and all of its surrounding forest in Redacted, Oregon. 
While SCP-7430 itself exhibits no self-evident hazards or anomalous properties, SCP-7430's anomalous effect is activated when an organic being crosses into it, at which point it will demanifest after a period of 40 seconds and 6 minutes. The effect occurs whenever said being is within the marked terrain of the forest, regardless of at what height. Commonly, animals affected by the anomaly are expendable, and experience increased stress and aggressive behavior prior to demanifestation. Of the two cases of humans who had been lost due to the anomaly, a feeling of disassociation and extreme confusion was recorded before their disappearance. Demanifestation of human subjects is extremely detrimental and may lead to a potential CK class reality restructuring scenario. Thank you for listening to SCP-7430, The Lockwood Mutilator by Crimson Fripp. If you enjoyed this SCP, please like and subscribe, and follow the link in the description to the SCP Wiki, and vote to support it and the SCP Wiki as a whole.